Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Suda, and I'm the director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada. Je m'appelle Sasha Suda, et je suis la directrice générale du Musée des Beaux-Arts de Canada. Tonight, I'm zooming in from the National Gallery here in Ottawa on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, who have been the caretakers of this land for millennia. Je suis ravie d'avoir l'opportunité de dire quelques mots à l'occasion de la série de conférences des artistes invités de la Fondation Stonecroft de cette année. This important annual event happens thanks to a long and productive collaboration between the Stonecroft Foundation, the National Gallery of Canada, and the University of Ottawa. Je tiens à remercier les deux partenaires du musée pour tout ce qu'ils font pour contribuer à la réalisation de ce projet. The 2020 edition is the sixth lecture in this ongoing series. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us in Zoom space this year. I know there's competition for your time, and we don't take for granted that you've chosen to join us. I'm pretty sure I know why you've come, though, and it's because this year we welcome Vancouver-based Ken Lum as our guest artist. The National Gallery of Canada has many of Ken's work in its collection, some of which I'm sure he will talk about this evening. Best known for his unsettling photo text diptychs or portrait logos, Lum has always poked at festering divisions in Canadian society. He shines a light on the experience of immigrants, tension between police and Indigenous peoples, and divisions of race and class. He often uses humor, which makes us all as viewers think long and hard about why we're laughing. The pandemic has heightened those divisions and I'm excited to hear Ken speak about how his art has been impacted by the crisis that surrounds us all and really that consumes us all. Ken is known for his conceptual and representational art in various media, including painting, sculpture and photography. For the past 30 years, he has shown his work in major exhibitions all over the world. Ken Lum is a revered artist in Canada and internationally, and we're lucky to have with him with us tonight. You can see Ken's work at the National Gallery of Canada and encourage you to come and visit us soon and in person. We're open Thursday through Sunday and more than 41,000 people have come to see us since we reopened in July. Before we hear from Ken, you'll hear welcome remarks from Elder Claudette Comanda of Kidgan Zibi, Dean Kevin Key of the University of Ottawa, and lastly, Ginny Yu of the University of Ottawa to introduce Ken Lum. Thank you again to Ken, Jose, and to you, the audience, and everyone at the Stonecroft Foundation, at the National Gallery of Canada, and at the University of Ottawa for making this event possible. Bonsoir et merci. Greetings, everyone. Bijaja Komar, Anishinaabe et Kio Mamawenaniwag. Bonjour tout le monde. Bevenu ici la territoire ancestrale de mes Pepagonquin. I am always honored and always proud to bring welcome words on behalf of the Algonquin Nation to greet brothers and sisters from everywhere. I welcome you to this beautiful homeland of the Algonquin people, the homeland that has been entrusted since time immemorial by my ancestors and the homeland which we must ensure will be here forevermore for our children. I bring you greetings and I say welcome. I bring you greetings and I say I hope that everyone is doing well during these hard times that we are all experiencing due to COVID-19 pandemic. It is with love, with kindness and friendship that I welcome you. I'm very honored to give these welcoming words for the sixth annual Stonecroft Lecture. And to welcome one of Canada's leading international artists, Ken Lum. So on behalf of the Algonquin Nation, again, I say to you, welcome brothers and sisters, welcome to this beautiful land of the Algonquin people. Bevenu tout le monde ici à la territoire ancestrale de les Pepagonquins. Please take good care, be well, be safe, and remember 
An act of kindness is such a blessing in the same way that art is such healing. And we all need to heal. We all need to stand together and praise one another and hold one another in good thought, hold one another in good heart, hold one another in good prayer. Take good care. I love you all. Kizagian, miigwech. Thank you. Bonsoir, Madame Souda, Mr. Lum, Madame Commanda, chers étudiantes et étudiants, chers collègues et chers amis. Before we begin, I would like to pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. Nous reconnaissons les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons aussi leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Tonight you will have the pleasure to participate in the sixth annual Stonecroft Visiting Artist Lecture Series offered by the distinguished artist, Mr. Ken Lum. Je tiens à remercier sincèrement et chaleureusement la Fondation Stonecroft pour les arts, the Stonecroft Foundation for the Arts, pour sa générosité et son rôle primordial dans la promotion des arts et les artistes canadiens de grande envergure. Thank you for your unwavering support and for the vital role that you play in promoting the arts in Canada. The Faculty of Arts and the University of Ottawa are proud to count you as our friends and partners. I also want to offer our warmest welcome and thanks to Ken Lum, one of Canada's leading international artists. Votre présence ici ce soir nous honore au plus au point et c'est avec enthousiasme que nous attendons votre présentation et la discussion qui suivra. It's an honor to welcome you tonight and to have the privilege to hear you speak. Thank you. Merci également au Musée des Beaux-Arts du Canada pour sa précieuse collaboration et tout particulièrement à Madame Sacha Souda, la directrice générale, pour son accueil sur cette plateforme numérique ainsi que pour son appui et son engagement. We feel privileged to have the opportunity to collaborate with you and your institution. Un grand merci à également à l'équipe du département d'art visuel à l'Université d'Ottawa et son directeur Jacob Judabic et la professeure Ginny Yu pour son travail remarquable dans l'organisation de cet événement. Et finalement, merci aux membres Merci vous, communauté universitaire, de votre présence ce soir. I wish you a wonderful evening, and I now ask Professor Yu to introduce tonight's distinguished guest and speaker. Merci, Dorian Kevinki, et bienvenue à toutes et tous à la sixième série de conférences d'artistes de la Fondation Stonecroft. I would like to thank Elder Claude Commanda for welcoming us to this unceded and unsurrendered territory of Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I feel always grateful to be able to live and work here. Au département d'art visuel de l'Université d'Ottawa, nous sommes très fiers de notre programme de maîtrise en art visuel. Les étudiants qui sont inscrits à la maîtrise sont invités à adopter une approche multidisciplinaire qui comprend une diversité de pratiques artistiques, de la photographie aux arts médiatiques, en passant par la performance, la sculpture, la peinture, le dessin, la vidéo et l'installation. During their two-year training at the department, our students take an in-depth look at practices and theories informing contemporary art and image culture in both official languages. Our MFA program is small and selective. A maximum of seven candidates are admitted each year, which allows for frequent one-on-one -on -one student professor interactions, good studio time and working space, even during these challenging times. 
Seven years ago, the Stonecroft Foundation for the Arts made a generous gift to the Department of Visual Arts as they have been impressed with the effect that our MFA program was having in auto art community and beyond. And they wanted to encourage us further by financing two very important projects for the department. So together, the Stonecroft Foundation and the department created a scholarship to allow one MFA student to take a course at the Venice Biennale that I teach with Jonathan Chanasi, an adjunct professor at our department and associate curator of contemporary art at the National Gallery of Canada. This collaboration with the gallery allows for the student to do an internship in Canada Pavilion at the Venice Biennale during the events of the opening week, working directly with the staff of the gallery and interacting with the international art world. The other op, uh, project funded through the generous contribution of the Stonecroft Foundation and thanks to the incredible collaboration of the gallery, two institutions with whom the department is proud to partner is the reason we are gathered here tonight. The annual Stonecroft Visiting Artist Lecture Series in support of contemporary art discourse allows the public to learn from prominent Canadian artists themselves about their practices. So this evening, for the sixth edition of the Stonecroft Lecture Series, we're delighted that Ken Lum has accepted our invitation to give an artist talk, which will be followed by a conversation and question period moderated by José Drouin Brisbois, the Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Canada. During the evening, please use the Q&A box to type in your questions. Now to introduce Ken, Ken Lum is an artist best known for his conceptual and representational art, working in different media, including painting, sculpture, and photography. His art deals with how meanings are assigned to images, texts, and objects based on cultural, racial, and social codes. A longtime professor, he currently is the chair of fine arts at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design in Philadelphia. He has published extensively, including a book of his collected writings issued by Concordia University Press in 2020. He has given keynote speeches for the Sydney Biennial, World Museums Conference in Shanghai, and the University's Art Association of Canada. He has an extensive art exhibition record that includes Documenta 11, the Venice Biennale, Sao Paulo Biennale, Shanghai Biennale, Carnegie Triennial, Sydney Biennale, Liverpool Biennale, Guangzhou Biennale, and the Whitney Biennale. Solo exhibitions include the CCA Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts in San Francisco, Kunstmuseum Luzerne in Switzerland, Witte Witt Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam, and the Vancouver Art Gallery. Since the mid-1990s, Lum has worked on numerous major permanent public art commissions, including for the cities of Vienna, the Ingadins in Switzerland, Rotterdam, St. Louis, Leiden, Utrecht, Toronto, and Vancouver. Lum was project manager for seminal exhibition, The Short Century, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945 to 1994. He has also worked as a curator for several large scale exhibitions, including Shanghai Modern, 1919 to 1945, Sharjah Biennial 7 and Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia. He is co-founder and chief curatorial advisor for Monument Lab. He is represented by Magenta Plains Gallery in New York, Royal Projects in Los Angeles, Gallery Nagel Draxler in Berlin, and Misashin Gallery in, in Tokyo. Before we welcome Ken on the screen, I would like to thank the Stonecroft Foundation for the Arts for their generosity and trust the National Gallery of Canada for their collaboration, 
and Ken Nam for accepting this invitation, and the University of Ottawa MFS student Pete Kahoot for his help in organizing this event. Enjoy the lecture. Merci. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm still, um, I've been teaching uh, online uh, mostly, uh, just occasionally showing up uh, at the University of Pennsylvania where I'm the chair, and, uh, but most of the time online, and I'm still not used to it. It's, uh, I really miss the face-to-face uh, -face presence of, uh, particularly of students, and I know there are quite a few here. I'm pleased to, um, uh, I wanna thank everybody for uh, associated with Stonecroft Foundation, the National Gallery of Canada, and the University of Ottawa as well. Um, I think some of you may know that my first teaching experience was at, as an adjunct professor or sessional, I guess they say in Canada, at, at, uh, at the University of Ottawa, a uh, long time ago. And um, there were two students in, in that class. Uh, uh, one was Melly Shum, who became an icon in my work, and the other was David Hart, who's uh, quite a well-known um, Canadian artist, who's also a faculty member in the department I lead in Philadelphia. So I'm pleased to uh, start by uh, um, just do, uh, doing an artist talk and, uh, and then um, theorizing that as opposed to uh, offering a paper and so on, because I'm, I'm, I'm be honest, I'm a little bit fatigued by of writing uh, pa papers. But I think it's also more apt uh, given the context of uh, students. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And so, what I'm going to do is, uh, and I've never done it in this fashion before, I'm going to um, speak about each genre of work that they don't, uh, in chronological order according to each genre as, a, as opposed to when they were actually realized. What I tend to do is I, I work in several um, channels or streams of work, and then I will jump from a furniture sculpture work to a language painting work to, and then back to a furniture sculpture work. But I thought it might be interesting just to, um, see all at once furniture sculpture work or good good many of them and so on so i want to start by how say, saying something about my background um, um, i came from um, a, a background that doesn't lend itself to uh, uh becoming an artist my mother worked in a sweatshop and and uh my father's a bit tr troubled I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh it was very um trying and uh, I didn't speak English, a uh, word of English, uh, until uh, I entered into my first day in grade one. And, um, and imagine how <laughs> traumatic that was at that time. And um, so I realized um, very early on uh, two things. One was, a, one was that um, I said that I, 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 I saw the world uh, literally kind of uh, between rulers and the world. And, and I understood that my family, my context, myself included, was part of the rule as, a part of, uh, as opposed to part of the rulers. And the rulers, and I, even at the age of six or even earlier, I, I knew this, I sensed this because I lived in a, you know, a, 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 a multi-ethnic enclave, maybe about at that time, 40% uh, Chinese and then another 15% or, uh, or maybe even more um, First Nations and 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 then an, another uh, thirty or forty percent, you know, Italians, Greeks, um, African Canadians, and from Hogan's Alley and so on. So I lived right next to Ch Chinatown, and we were we were we, it was like um, you know muskox and that or pointed out the world was kind of threatening and and uh, and, and uh, we were always struggling and so on. And that gave um, that was very important in terms of my own formation, my own later thinking about art. When I became um, introduced to art, I didn't, I didn't, I always liked doing art uh, um, in the sense of, I could, I always had the uh, ability to, to draw and um, I liked drawing and so on, but I, I never trained in it and I never really followed uh, that, a course on it. It was just not an option for me given, given my background. And I think that's one of the things that is largely unspoken even today in terms of the in terms of the art world, who gets to become an artist is actually a question of privilege to, to a great degree. And so when I became interested in art um, in, in my pretty well my late in my third year of um, undergraduate, um, I, uh, I was kind of fascinated by, immediately fascinated by what passed as contemporary art. 
because uh, up until that point, I really thought art was about how well you drew a figure, how well you drew a horse, <laughs> and, and so on. And I just couldn't quite reconcile how I had these new colleagues in 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 in, in my undergraduate art class that had aspirations uh, of being an art uh, being artists, and yet had no technical ability to to render or draw. And so it was a kind of a shocking system, but I, but at some point I, I realized um, that there was something deeper about uh, art and, and it didn't make sense, my, 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 my then I would say conservative view of, of art. And so this was like one of the very first pieces I did as an undergraduate student. It was called um, uh, uh, Sculpture for Dream, uh, 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 Public Lounge, Living Room Public Lounge. It was done in 1978. And I rented out, uh, no, I didn't rent out, I borrowed um, Ian Wallace, another noted Vancouver artist's studio to make this piece. And, um, and uh, basically I just rented out furniture. And uh, I, it, it took me a few months to even realize this piece because I, I didn't have any money. I was working in several part-time jobs and including a burger flipping <laughs> place. And uh, I saved up enough money just to uh, rent this furniture, put it together as a sculpture and, um, and uh, I showed it. The response was uh, negligible, I would say. Most people were bit, largely uh, befuddled by it, unlike today where um, nowadays museums have asked me, can you do a furniture piece? We love it and so on. But at that time, people didn't really quite know what to make of it. But what I was really interested in was, was uh, you see at the time I was learning about uh, particularly American and European avant-garde art, uh, minimal art and such. And uh, I was really interested in, in, in this kind of duality of a particularly minimal sculpture in uh, regarding um, a, a kind of uh, a, a kind of a, a depletion, a kind of a kind of um, a erasure of the kind of social referencing uh, of, of the work, because all, all works, you know, s signify some degree of social referencing through the materials and so on. But as you as you may know, Minimal art really made, made it into an, uh, an, a high art, this kind of discourse of phenomenology without any tangible relationship to the social environment and, and such. So I was kind of interested in, and of course, minimal art was also designed such a way that it configured its, its form to the, to the dimensions of the space in which it was exhibited. But I was also, so it was a very spatial uh, work, right? And they talked about the kind of presence of minimal art. And of course, the presence of minimal art was nothing but, uh, for me, uh, I, I recognize that as the alienation problem, the problem of estrangement from the objects that, that machines have fashioned um, and, and that we surround ourselves with as implements of our, of, our, of our daily lives. We have no, we've lost the kind of connection to, to the kind of hand, we've lost the connection to be, uh, due to you know mass production and, and and so on, so there's a kind of melancholic, tragic element to this work. Plus, I was also interested in um, in in how a work can situate itself in multiple spaces. If you if you know the work of Robert Smithson, right, the nonset was premised on the idea of of the original. Uh, the nonset would be uh, was the original uh, spaces in which in which it is called up as the work is is cited within the exhibition space and so on. And so here the space of the exhibition space is called up, the space potentially of the collector who buys the works, a living room or wherever uh, they put it uh, is called up. And, uh, and, and also I was interested in the configuration of private corporate space as well. So there's multiple spaces that, that I'm, I'm interested in and that forms a kind of a thread throughout, throughout my work. And the work became much more elaborate and so on. And, um, and when I did this piece, I, I, I sometimes tell this uh, anecdote because, it's, uh, because I think it's uh, important. Um, when I did, uh, showed this, at, um, it, I won't say where because it may reveal the cur curator. When I showed this once, uh, this image in a talk, I mentioned how um, I, I picked this furniture because uh, my mother would have loved this furniture. And it was, this furniture would have been way beyond our station, let's put it that way, right? And I kind of mentioned that, and of course that solicited some, some giggles among, in, in the audience. I don't know why, but it did. And then um, later on at, at dinner, uh, there was a noted, very noted curator uh, at, uh, looking at me uh, at the dinner table and uh, 
he looked over at me and, uh, and he just said, you know, I don't believe you. And I said, you don't believe me, why? I don't believe you when you say that your mother would have, would have uh, loved this furniture. It's, and I said, why not? And, and he said to me, it's clearly ugly, right? I say that story because, because not the shock, but I say that story as an, another kind of unspoken rule in terms of, in terms of the art system, which is maybe it's, maybe it's uh, mitigated somewhat today, but at, uh, but at that time, I really found it uh, obviously offensive, but it was, it was also shocking because, I, because this, this person who is highly, highly regarded curator in the art system could not imagine um, you know, uh, you know, variations of taste due to social class and so on. And I, I so here's another one. And it, they were fun uh, for me to do because I could, you know, mimic after uh, minimalist uh, strategies and such. And these uh, couches would be, it's called line and couches would be e e equally spaced apart from wall to uh, the first couch and same distance between each subsequent couch as, uh, and so on. Here's another variation, uh, you know, so I was doing a lot of quotations because I was still learning about our partially buried sofa, which pays reference to uh, Robert Smithson, you know, partially buried uh, woodshed and such, and uh, who's, a, uh, who's a big influence to me. I, I was very influenced by uh, you know, uh, Rossler, Graham, Asher, Buren, Wiener, um, a lot of uh, uh, Valley Explore, uh, even Gina Pane, um, um, a lot of these uh, kind of conceptual artists. Uh, I was very, very, uh, Adrian Piper, I was very interested in at that time. And, um, and in Vancouver, the Vancouver, it was then called the Vancouver School of Art. There was a lot of, um, uh, in uh, Ian Wallace's, uh, a contemporary art now class, he brought in a lot of um, noted uh, uh, artists from Europe and, and America, and they were all generally conceptually based, and that had an enormous uh, influence on me. And so in this piece here, um, basically, um, I, I don't actually make it or especially uh, order it. Um, it's uh, the only thing uh, I think in this case was I, I asked that it'd be reupholstered in a very bright orange and there are four sections, right? But obviously the four sections are only meant to be two sections at most, not four sections, two uh, uh, horizontal sections that, that run down the length. And then I placed them together. This was done at the um, Venice Biennale. It's called uh, uh, Ship, of, uh, Ship of Fools, which, which is actually a, uh, a reference to uh, Foucault, where he, his essay on Ship of Fools, uh, it, was, it was called uh, um, Madness and, um, what was the book? I can't remember <laughs> right now, but, it's, but it was about madness and about um, how um, the, the mad, the people who were you know, uh, mad, as in um, insane, uh, were uh, were treated with some privileged status, and they would be uh, on sent off on a boat from town to town, and the, each village that uh, in which they uh, they arrived at, docked at, would they would be celebrated. So I was kind of interested in in, in kind of multiple reference of that, and of course referencing uh, you know tourism and so on during the time of the Venice Biennale. And um, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, after the sofa piece, I, I would do this piece as opposed to the subsequent furniture pieces. I, I just thought maybe it might be interesting to delineate each genre uh, in, in, in the various iterations for change. And so I was, as I said, I was interested in avant-garde art of the, uh, that I was just learning a, a, about. Again, this is also a student work, undergraduate student work. And, um, and what I was doing here was um, collapsing the most conventional way to depict a person through, you know, studio photography and, and so on with this kind of generic uh, background and, you know, all these kind of codified uh, laws in terms of presentation and, and so on, right? And you see this in, in, in schools and in classrooms and 
and so on. So, um, uh, or real estate, um, you know, uh, cards that real estate agents would have. It's it's the same system of uh, of uh, photography, and they would be collapsed with some logo, right? And this is the Channel Four logo for WNBC in New York, which actually has some kind of r residue of of an early Frank Stella stripe painting. And so I was doing these kinds of collisions between the two because, of course, there is a relationship between the two, right? We do live in that social economy of local types that's, uh, that, is, uh, that is important regarding branding in the capitalist society, right? But, but the initial receptions for these works were that they were, um, they were uh, too brutal. And, uh, and or the re some people even read it that as a, I was making some sort of apologia of capitalism. I was making some sort of defense of capitalism, which I certainly was not, or that, um, uh, I, as opposed to making works that were, um, I'm not sure, salutary, uh, salutary of, uh, and um, mitigating of the harshness of the uh, society we live in, I kind of um, presented it in the most kind of stark relationship. And that's what I tend to do. I'm, I'm very interested in that starkness. In fact, I had a curator uh, uh, also come up to me and say, well, you know, your, your work doesn't look very Canadian and so on. And uh, I said, well, why not? He goes, well, Canadian art uh, always has a redemptive um, component, uh, has a redemptive ambition. I said, well, I'm not, I'm not that type of artist, right? But I always thought that my work came out of my background uh, in, in a working class family um, of a, you know, my uh, immigrant mother and uh, in a, uh, and I always had to work. My mother always had to work. So it's in that kind of harsh environment not the environment that you may see in terms of tourist brochures, but the real environment that a lot of Canadians uh, grew up in. So this is called Untitled Ed. And the blue section is just, it doesn't matter, but it's a, a corporation called Demco, right? And I tried to find a logo that would uh, have one straight side to it so that I couldn't join the photograph. These works here, I hired out a photographer to take because I thought at the time it was it, it, it more in conceptually true. I, I felt a need to oblige the kind of conceptual rules of fidelity that I'm calling up. And I didn't think I could do it convincingly. Neither did I have that kind of fake library backgrounds and, and so on of a, of a, of a, of a ready-made studio to take the pictures. And so this work would be, uh, you know, I guess it's about four, they're not, they weren't very big. I would say it's about four and a half feet tall. And, and, and the, the blue section you see there is plexiglass and it extends, I'll, I'll just extend my cursor here, extends all the way here. And then this pic, the photograph itself is just simply laminated on top of an extended plexiglass frame. And this work here is called um, Untitled Zainab, who was a Governor General's Awards <laughs> winner this year. And the works got, um, I, I started to shift because I wasn't satisfied with the, with the uh, starkness, I guess, of, of those works. And I was kind of interested in creating greater equilibrium between the picture half, the depicted half, and the name half or the logo type half. And so I started to um, uh, create specialized logos for, for friends of mine or associates I ran into and so on. And so I didn't really know, the, uh, you know, I knew Mr. Jansen a little bit and I knew he had a big family. And so I coaxed him into having a picture taken. And so I designed uh, a logo for, for um, his family. So of course, um, you know, it's, it's akin to a heraldic shield. It's not, and, and you see this all the time with uh, namesake uh, uh, branding anyways, like, um, like Dell computers after Michael Dell Getty Oil is J.P. Uh, J, J. Getty, and so on. So there's lots of names of companies, uh, yeah, you know, Charles Schwab and, and so on, are actually named after um, a, 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 our natural family and so on, these, these logos. And Rita and Mrs. Sandy. And... Um, here, I, I'm also interested in, you know, the, the laws of society. I've mentioned laws a couple of times, but laws of society. 
And of course, we also still live very much under the law of patriarchy, the law of the father, the law of the name of the father, right? And so Sandi is really the father's name, the father's family name, not the mother's family name, certainly not the daughter's family name. They assume Sandi as their own family name. And so in a sense, Mr. Sandi is represented here in the green and, and yellow. And the, fam fa and the family is actually complete. And then you have Steve. The odd thing about giving a talk on Zoom is that there's no reaction. <laughs> So it's a owner family. So these would be all specially designed for um, for the family, and and they don't they're not corporations or anything like that. And again, just to point out, you know, the law of the father, you know, owners uh, is obviously the the father's name. Her last name is a Chinese name, was Wang. And uh, Wong, of course, would be also her father's name. Cecil and Ethel Grote. And then um, I decided, well, I can't keep hiring Boone Huey to take my pictures uh, since uh, I, I didn't think, uh, I, I thought at some point it was too limiting. He, he, he did terrifically for me, but at some point I needed to branch out. And, and so I started learning how to uh, take my own pictures with a, with, uh, initially with a, um, a Hasselblad camera, a medium format, and then later on with a uh, larger 4x5 camera, generally a Sinar camera and, or, or a larger um, medium format camera like a Mamiya uh, RZ67 camera and so on. So it, it is, a, is a kind of, a, a, you know, a, saying uh, adieu to Boone Hu, I decided, I asked him whether I could take his picture in the style of uh, he would take my picture, right? So this is Boone Huey photography. And I think this is in the National Guard of Canada. I was very interested, uh, as you may tell, in um, depicting uh, very, from right from the start, a very multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, population which uh, I was interested in. That was the way I grew up. And so obviously uh, what is great about ca countries like Canada, it's very heterogeneous in terms of its, in terms of its population. And yet um, at that time when I was doing that, uh, there were actually very, uh, I would receive comments saying, well, why are, you, why are you doing that? They thought, some people actually read it as didactic. When I, when I didn't have any such intention, I just saw this, that's the reality. I wasn't trying to say, isn't it great? Uh, of course, I do think it's great, but, but I wasn't trying to make a point of underlining multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity as, as, as uh, something that was you know, wonderful just to make that point. I was doing it because that was my, that was my experience. That was my lived experience in terms of, in terms of Canadian society. And so it was, it was odd to me to occasionally get that comment that I was trying to uh, make some didactic point about the merits of uh, multiculturalism. Jillian and Smokey. And then uh, you can sort of see that I was, you know, the graphic side I was really uh, uh, developing an interest in. I do think that, you know, graphic is, is and, and fonts and so on, especially now uh, with all the social media and the internet, still remains so deeply, deeply under theorized. You know the kind of pictorialism of 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 of, of text, uh, the let uh, and so on, and and the kind of textuality of pictures. I was really interested in that kind of involution, one one to the other. This is uh, premised on a. Uh, at that time, uh, I was told that this was the uh, number one, uh, premised on the number one best-selling postcard in Canada, not, not particularly the, this picture I took, but one of uh, a group of uh, First Nations in a feathered headdress standing in front of a stagecoach caravan uh, flanked by two red Serge Mounties and with the Canadian Rockies in the background. And that was the number one selling tourist postcard. And so I, when I noticed this postcard, I went, well, you know, it, it presented as a kind of native people as, as a kind of museum existence right, maybe even dormant or 
or, 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 or of the past. And so I, I wanted to kind of re, uh, represent it, but as, 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 you know, in the here and now. I'm very interested in the entire panoply, you know, almost like an August Sander archive, the panoply of peoples without moralizing, without saying this is pity me or, and so on. And I think that was, that was a bit shocking at the time to, for Canadians. Like I somehow had to show my cards of uh, sympathy and so on, which I, which I wasn't so interested in doing. Alex Gonzalez loves his mother and father. Right, and, and I was very interested in, I remember going to a museum in Europe and um, because I, I never went to Europe until I was uh, 29 years old. And so finally when I, I got a chance to go to a museum, um, I remember seeing a painting, uh, you know, of there's a bean, bean eater, someone's just eating a bean soup and then all these kinds of topics that were everyday quotidian and, uh, you know, la vie de tous les jours subjects. And so I thought, wow, okay. And when I ran into a German friend on that same trip, who, uh, his uh, parents I, I, I know also quite well, I said, how are your parents? And, uh, he, and uh, Daniel, and he said, he said, uh, he, you know, his English was not absolutely fluent, but it's good. And he said, oh, my mother and father, I, I, I love my mother and father, right? So, and, and I thought at least the way I took it was, it was because of his lack of fluency in English that he kind of blurted it out that way, right? And with, with, which was truer in terms of his sentiments, right? That this kind of public avowal of his, of his affections for his parents came out because, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it almost, almost carefreely because of his um, in, in, in insufficiency of English. And so I thought that, that could be, be, make an interesting work. And Meli Sham hates her job which now has a museum um, named after her in, uh, in Rotterdam, which we'll get into uh, later on. Uh, by the way, when I was teaching, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, when I was teaching as a sessional instructor in my first teaching uh, class, and I, I, was, I was god awful as a teacher at that time, by the way. And uh, so I feel sorry for these students. And so, um, you know, Melly Shum was a student of mine. And so um, it's great, you know. There's an article about her that just came out recently about where's Melly Shum today? And it was published in Holland. So she was a University of Ottawa art student. Bindi Sanji, employee of the month. Tracy Bond meets Pepe Pig. And, uh, you know, I, I have anecdotes for all these works. Um, you know, this one comes out of uh, my having a coffee at some um, West End Vancouver uh, coffee shop, when, which is located uh, next door to an A&W hamburger franchise. And the A&W root bear wallows down the street handing out coupons. I guess, you know, free root bear or root beer or hamburger or fries or whatever. And then... Uh, as, as the uh, root bear uh, approached right in front of uh, where I was sitting, this little girl with golden brown, uh, golden locks, like a Goldilocks, ran out, grabbed the a &W root bear by the, by the leg and looked up at it and said, I love you, a and root bear. Right, and, and I'm sitting there, I'm going, wow, okay, this, this is a piece, you know? And I was really interested in, in the uh, problem of, uh, of the root bear, you know, the bear as a character and uh, character of nature, uh, as a figure of nature, uh, usurping the enchantment of the child for the selling of hamburgers. And so in this case, it's Pepe's Pizza. Uh, a, a woodcutter and his wife. Um, this is a super popular piece. I, I wish I'd made 10 of, 10 of them. But um, this is a the first line comes from a woodcutter's wife is into the dark forest or live the woodcutter and his wife. That's the opening line of Hansel and Gretel, right? About an enchanted woodcutter and, and his wife goes out with a tiny ax and chops down a, a part of a branch of a tree 
a, maybe a sapling and that's enough wood to keep the fire in the hearth going for a few days, right? This is, this is a different story. This is a story of disenchantment with nature and, uh, and the economy that's premised on the destruction of, 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 of nature. So this is a work that comes out of my meditation of uh, living in British Columbia at the time. Um, and I encourage students when they make work to always, you know, I, I often uh, will encounter students say, I'm not sure what to say, what's a good subject. And, and I always say, well, I don't understand that because there's always something interesting in terms of your world, your background, right? There are all these kind of dissonant points that, that you can draw from to make interesting art. It's somehow, it's somehow too, for too many students, their own background is considered too banal and, or off limits to, to um, generating art when it's not true. Garbage pickers. We are Sacred Blade. The world's worst band. Nice guys, but terrible band. <laughs> By the way, the uh, guitars aren't plugged in. My name is Scott Rizicki. The kid is, you know, being tabbed by the police and, and that's what, you know, you have your identity. You, you, you have you, and then you also have your identity. That is your administrative identity, your birth name. But that's not you, right? That's only partly you. Uh, Rebecca Rosenberg sings Bye Bye Blackbird, and she's really belting it out. It actually comes out of a, uh, where I had a studio nearby and I'd hear this guy sing Bye Bye Blackbird every day for, for years <laughs> in Vancouver. And he would scroll up a piece of newspaper and uh, just sing into it like it was a real microphone. So a lot of the works come out of um, daily observations. And then the works, you know, the image text became even more um, equal, you might say, right? And I was really interested in the kind of mantric qualities of, of text that doesn't I, uh, repeat identically, but that they are variations one after the other. And that mantric quality, uh, which is, you know, erratic as well, it creates sound in, in, in someone's head as they're reading it, creates a kind of circulation, a kind of oscillation between image side and text side and so on, that you could apprehend very quickly the text because you can see there's only a limited number of words. But I was really interested in um, speak, referencing these moments where language is at its limits, language cannot, uh, lang lang language cannot adequately uh, in encapsulate what, what the feelings or, or the emotional stress or the trauma that's being experienced for that moment. I can't believe I'm in Paris. I can't believe I'm in Paris. So, you know, so she's, she's not rich. She's a working class woman. You, you may not be able to see it here, but she's got a huge leg scar right here where my cursor is. And the, sto the story is really about her, her, her impending demise. She may live another 15 years or 20 years, right? But the idea is that she's, she's worked hard and now she's saved up finally. And her lifelong dream is to uh, visit Paris. And she finally has visited Paris. So the story is really about mortality as well. And that's a kind of sub theme in my, in my work. I deal a lot with mortality and death. God, I miss you. I like myself the way I am. Again, the kind of mantric quality. There is no reason to change. I like myself the way I am. There is no reason to change. And these works are quite large, done on aluminum frames, uh, over six feet uh, or about two meters, not just under two meters tall. Very heavy. Onions, eggs, milk, butter, newspaper. It's about responsibility. I don't need a list. I, I remember it. Hey, that's not funny. That's not funny. Yeah. 
je, je, suis, je suis française, je suis américain, je suis anglaise, je suis canadien. Right? Again, I, I think this is like, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't believe I'm in Paris. You know, she's, uh, she's uh, une femme au troisième âge, <laughs> comment dire en français, right? So she's, she's learning French at a very advanced age. But as she's saying, je, je suis, at the moment of saying it, she's also thinking, who am I? Qui suis-je? Right? So she pauses. It becomes like an ontological reflection. Don't be silly, you're not ugly. You're not ugly, you're not ugly at all. You're being silly, you're just being silly. You're not, you're not ugly at all. And it doesn't matter what the uh, brunette says to the Asian woman, uh, she will never be persuaded that she's not ugly. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, my name is Fung. Again, identity, trying to learn Right, of course, he's, he's Fung, but he's also Fung as in F-U-N-G. He's also Fung in the Chinese uh, writing of the word. So he's, he's not just, right, but because he lives in an English society, he not, needs to learn how to uh, address and pronounce his, his identity as F-U-N-G. You don't love me. You've never loved me. When have you ever loved me? When have you ever given a shit about me? Right, again, the more she, she repeats variations of this line, the more it's lost. Her, the one person that she wants back will never come back. And these are all stage pictures, by the way. <laughs> and then I did these kind of mirror works. I'm going to try to speed through here. Um, which, uh, you know, how people uh, insert pictures uh, into the edge of uh, mirrored frames. These are permanently inserted and they're, and they're always, they're never inserted at an angle. They're always inserted uh, upright and perpendicular because I, they had to look formally strong and the, and the collection of pictures can come from multiple sources. It doesn't have to be identified with one person, but as soon as you put them into one frame, something happens, which is that you start reading it as a narrative of a possible subjectivity of, of a, uh, as being owned by one person of telling this or, or relaying the story of one person or one household or one family. And then the uh, gallery would be like this. I was interested in, in photography, but I wasn't interested in taking any pictures. And so I, I used, you know, uh, I collected up these pictures and they came in two sizes, portrait size and full figure size. And of course, in the act of identifying with these pictures from someone else along the margins of these works, you see other people also engaged in the same act. You also see yourself reflected in the act of looking. Uh, should I talk, I think I'll skip this. Um, so th this is the work I did in, um, uh, as one of uh, early public art piece for Leiden and it's for uh, the uh, Museum of Ethnology, the, uh, in, um, which is a kind of anthropological museum, which is an enterprise which is obviously not untroubled because it was tied to colonial legacies, imperial conquest, and uh, rap rap rapacity, right? Uh, the stealing of, of things and objects for, for collections in, in Western museums and so on. So I was invited to do something on the outside of this building and um, uh, in, 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 in Leiden, this, by the way, this is also the, uh, the first ethnological, anthropological museum in the world in, in, in the kind of modern sense. And so I said, well, can I do something in the, in the library, which they didn't call the library anymore, more they called it the information room. And the information room has a lot of comfortable chairs and only three walls. So that means when you come in and, and you can see the information room, almost like a neoclassical set where you see the two walls and then the back wall. And I said, well, why doesn't it have a, a, a fourth wall? Because, you know, it makes it slightly noisy with people coming in off the foyer. And they said, because it's to show symbolically that uh, we recognize the problematic status of the ethnological museum and that, um, uh, that we have nothing to hide and so on. And so I made this piece premised on um, the three Chinese monkeys, 
see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, but tied to the uh, phren phrenological comparative comparisons of, of profiles that was all the rage during, during the moment of founding of the Ethnological Museum in, in Leiden. So here's Speak No Evil, and that's the European profile. This is the African profile. See how it's exaggerated with the axial line of the profile jutting out, right? See No Evil, and then having some proximity to the axial line of the profile of the ape, Hear No Evil. So that's, uh, uh, and these are about 10 feet square. It doesn't, maybe not, doesn't look it, but it, it, it's, it's uh, eight and a half uh, by eight and a half to 10 feet square. And I did this work, uh, I, and I started doing these kind of mirror installations. This work is in, um, was in uh, the Istanbul Biennale. And uh, you walk down this corridor, right? And you see this long mirror. And on the opposite side is a text by uh, the great uh, Sufi poet, um, Yunus Emre, who, who wrote in Arabic. And, um, and, and, and it's a beautiful poem about embodiment. And it's also um, what he called realization. And uh, it also references the three great religions. Of course, Turkey being an Asia minor is also at the intersection of three great uh, religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and so on. And so you see this woman here in the uh, light blue um, uh, top, and she's walking down the course of this very long corridor in order to be able to read the text properly, because this text on her right, on your left side, is, uh, is printed backwards. And so the only way you can actually properly read it, because it's so long and so many heads are interfering, is to walk down this corridor. And once you walk towards the end of the corridor, here you can see it's in English as well. You can see it's uh, very readable here. You walk down to the end here where my cursor is, and then you do a you do a 90 degree turn. You go down a corridor, short one, then you go down another corridor um, to about here. And then you enter into an opening. And when you go, you, you, when you enter into that opening, you realize that this is actually a two-way glass, uh, and not a true mirror, but a two-way glass and uh, with a, one side highly reflective, right? And you, you can see the lamps here. I had a lot of lights here because you need it to be as reflective as possible. If you have a lot of luminosity, you create that kind of reflection. And so what happens is it's about this relationship between being seen and, 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 and not being aware of it uh, and so on. But it is also quite democratic in the sense that everyone who walks down this corridor eventually discovers the joke, you might say, the pun right, of being seen. And it was a very popular uh, piece. It's called The House of Realization. Oops. Oh, only one minute left. Okay, um, maybe I should speed through this. Uh, sorry for running so long. I, I did this in Documenta. I'll just end in about three minutes. I, I did this in Documenta, and it's called um, uh, Mirror Maze with Twelve Signs of Depression. And um, uh, I'm interested in these questions, right? You walk in, and and all you see is these lines of uh, of depression and. And, and so on. So I'm really interested in these kinds of things about subject formation and, and, and imagining the subjectivity of others. I was going to show you some of my new, <laughs> new work, but I'm going to skip that. Um, um, so I did uh, shopkeeper signs. I didn't time myself very well. Again, death, closed today in memory of Shirley Janet. Sure, it's just a made up name, it doesn't really exist. I won't talk about that. And then maybe I'll just end with these works because I'm really proud of uh, these works. These are uh, what I call necrology works and they're all texts, but they are all composed in a 19th century fashion um, of frontispiece language, which is lost. And um, I try to mimic this kind of 18th and 19th century language, which didn't oblige uh, in the contemporary sense of uh, rules of design. All right, and so um, I'll just read this and then one more and then we'll, I'll stop. Life as a key, key punch operator or the exciting escapades of Charlotte Wilson Turner, the seventh of 10 children of George and Harriet Wilson, who upon graduating from Camden High School became a first rate clerk typist for the Veterans Administration comprising anecdotes of Willie Turner, 
the police, uh, police officer husband to whom she was married 62 years with her death following exactly the one year anniversary of her husband's death, giving a full account of all their lark sprees, rows, rambles, and other frolics, including saving up and going on a Caribbean cruise, being a faithful portraiture of her joy in her daughters, Josephine and Lucy, and her love of sewing with particular observations of her attending the Camden School of Office training to further herself as a key punch operator until her debt health failed, forcing retirement, but remaining active as an usher in the Antioch Camden Baptist Church. So these are very kind of like everyday lives. I was kind of interested in kind of heroizing through this kind of elaborate text. And I'll just read one more. I'll read this one and end it because it's it, it, the most the most unfortunate case. And these would be very large. They're like around 2.6 2 meters tall, larger in fact, 2.8 meters tall. The most unfortunate case of Lucy Chono Santos convicted of smuggling heroin into Indonesia, whose mistake was to fall victim to a phony employment recruiter who fronted for an international drug gang and later threatened to kill Lucy's family if she refused to do as the gang demanded. Follow her story from growing up in a shanty on the edge of Manila, where she supported her parents and siblings by retrieving value from garbage to bearing a child at a tender age of whom she was separated for several years as she sat on death row of it waiting execution by firing squad, passing her days in a squalid and overcrowded prison. To this is offered the particularities of her finality, including the many press stories, legal and diplomatic documents, and the many affecting and heartrending letters to her son written a short time prior to her demise, all pressed from the originals of her own handwriting. So I'll end it with that there because I think that gives you a good picture in terms of the variety of work and my obsessions with life, death, and, and uh, subject formation and so on. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ken. That was fantastic. I learned a lot. <laughs> that was good. I thought I knew, but then I learned a lot. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. So I'm José Drouin Brisebois, the Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery. Merci à tout le monde d'être ici ce soir. Um, so I uh, wanted to also take this opportunity to invite our mem audience members to uh, write questions for Ken in the Q&A uh, qu um, section of Zoom. Uh, Q&R is actually how it shows up in French for me. <laughs> C'est question et réponse. Um, and uh, what we can talk about for maybe about 15 minutes, Ken, and, and see if people have questions is really around monuments and public art. Um, and specifically, I wanted to hear you talk about Monument Lab, this amazing project that you were involved with uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, that was really focused on ways that publicly cited art memorials and monuments operate. Mm -hmm. And my question really is, what did you learn and take away from this project? Well, it's uh, well, I'm still learning, so it's not like uh, the process has ended. But I could I could tell you that when I first moved to Philadelphia in 2012 to assume my position at University of Pennsylvania, one of the first things I noticed about that city because it's a you know rel relatively old city for uh, North America, at least a formalized terms. And uh, I noticed that uh, the, the kind of disequilibrium in terms of the monumental inventory of the city. City has over a thousand statues, right? And yet there are, yet the first full figured officially sanctioned statue of an African American did not come about until 2017, right? And, Af and uh, you know, Philadelphia has a proud and also horrible uh, history in terms of that qu question proud in the sense that it was a, uh, it was a uh, entry point for the uh, underground rail railway. Uh, not so proud because there were also a lot of lynchings and, and such that took place. And, uh, and a great history of, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois was from there. Um, and also a lot of uh, great jazz musicians, um, Duke Ellington, you know, played there regularly and, and uh, you know, uh, and, and so on. And, um, and yet, there was, so that disequilibrium I found kind of fascinating. I, um, I met up with uh, someone teaching at, in urban studies and we were commenting about this. And uh, I always had this idea to have an, uh, a negative history festival, right? Mm -hmm. A kind of festival that talks about, it, 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 that would be citywide, but that actually talks about the kind of um, 
truth, the, the, the sagacious, um, you know, uh, knowledge that uh, people uh, in their lived experience uh, uh, in, uh, can impart. And so Monument Lab came uh, as a result of that in uh, 2012. And then we decided to do an exhibition about it, but, and uh, it was comprised of two parts. One was, you know, uh, more, slightly more conventional, like a, like a Biennale type where you commission artists to do something. But then the other part was the radical part, which was that we would do it kind of, we would extend it as a democratic project to ask people of Philadelphia what they wanted for a monument, mm -hmm. right? And it, and it just evolved. Like now I'm very interested. In, I do a lot of talks uh, on, on the iconography of all kinds of monuments all kinds of monuments which are very banal and uh, that uh, we don't really question, right? For, for quite a number of years, I was doing one on, um, I cited, you know, slave ownership and, and, and so on, including James McGill in Montreal mm. and so on. And so some people said, wow, you were so ahead of the, ahead of the uh, game, so to speak. And I, I never thought that at all. I, I thought it was, it was something that was known for a long time. No one, it was the only difference was that I worked at formalizing the, the, uh, an entity around that question of monuments. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, what I was really impressed by was uh, really the level of engagement and involvement of the public. Um, you know, the the fact that you you had this kind of opportunity for people to submit. Um, and I was curious, what are, what are the next steps for the city of Philadelphia with, right. with this project? Well, I mean, I, I can tell you that when we uh, collected up all the uh, you know, uh, thoughts of Philadelphians regarding what should be remembered and so on, right? Quite a few people actually uh, cited, uh, you know, well, there should be a monument to uh, better schools because schools are a disaster in America as, you, as most Canadians probably, probably know, unless, unless you have money, then it's fine, right? And so on. So, and uh, uh, you know, some said we need a monument to garbage collection Right, because it's a very poor, you know, it's still the largest poor city in America. We need, and then about three percent, you know, a minority of the people said we need a monument to remember the move bombing of 1985, right? And um, but that was a significant percentage. It, what that meant was, and the city has never acknowledged it, never even a, a addressed, let alone atoned for the uh, upheaval that was that was wrecked on its own citizens which resulted in many deaths, by the way. And that was the civil rights? Uh... It was a kind of a cult. It was, there was a cult called the, uh, John Africa and his family, and they were a cult. But, but, and they were advocating, it sounds crazy now, but they were, they were vegans. They believed in sustainability. They were, you know, they ate tofu and all that kind of stuff. But they were seen as weird, and, 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 and they refused to have their children uh, schooled in public school. They felt that they, they, you know, they they may have been coined the term deschooling. They were the ones that so we we can school our children better, and maybe they could, but it was intolerable to to the city to the city at the time. And so, what that meant was that even though the city has not acknowledged, uh, you know, the, it's the trespasses it committed uh, on the city um, of its of, on its own citizens. Um, it, Philadelphians have long memories; they remember it. Just like I'm sure if you did that um, for the people of Ottawa, all kinds of local knowledges, which are which I think we we ignore at, or underestimate at our peril. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I mean, I know you know over the years uh, how involved you've been with public art. And um, did Monument Lab change the the way you think or your approach to public art? And I'm thinking specifically about like your experience in Philadelphia and a place like Vancouver. You know, like what, what you know, how different is is that for you, um, having gone from one place to the other? Well, I've I've written um, several um, points in my book mm -hmm. that I've never felt at home, no matter where I where I am. Mm -hmm. I did. Even even though growing up in, I mean, I'm I'm more at home in the sense that I in in, in Vancouver because I I'm, I'm familiar with things. But deep deep down, I wasn't any more at home than I am at Philadelphia. In a funny way, because I know Philadelphia is not uh, where my formation was. I feel more at home in, in an odd way. I know I would say that um, the when I moved to Philadelphia, of course, it's, the terms are different. It's much more complex. It's America after all, and so. And, and it's much more subject to comparative racism and, and those types of things. But, uh, but
but I think I, I think all my work somehow was open to to those questions, open to those problems, even from Vancouver. And so when I um, moved to Philadelphia, it it I felt I felt many of the things I was interested in was actually affirmed. Mm. And so, what are what are some of your thoughts about monuments in Canada? Well, I, it's not just monuments; it's also names and, and so on, right? I mean, I come from a, a, a province. I mean, it's got a doubly colonial name, British Columbia. I think it's god awful name, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I think there, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think and Canadians tend to be a little bit a little bit too self satisfied and mm -hmm. smug about those those questions, right? Um, you know. Um, and uh, like I grew up uh, where I, my first, all, all my schools was Lord Selkirk, you know, Prime Minister Gladstone, mm -hmm. you know, Admiral Seymour. Admiral Seymour was, a, was one of the key persons prosecuting the, the, um, the opium war off mm -hmm. the harbor of Canton, right? Mm -hmm. And my roots are, are from Canton. So it's one of those kind of weird things where, where you know, I, I went to a school that celebrate this, this guy that was bombing and killing Chinese during the opium war and, and I'm Chinese. And I, when I went to school there, it was maybe about 35% Chinese and all Cantonese, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of things that we, we need to, to really deal with uh, in Canada. In, in a funny way, America is both more regressive and more progressive. And that's what makes it very schizophrenic as a, as a place to live, right? The production of knowledge is, is, is like much more kind of fecund and rapid. I don't. I can't believe. I don't believe that monument level would have been even possible in, in in um, Canada. I mean, in a very short time, I had. I, you know, we had this idea. We we pitched this idea to different uh, foundations, and uh, next thing you knew, we had like two and a half million dollars to a major exhibition. Amazing. And, and just I mean, recently, we got four million dollars from Mellon. Right? Wow. Now we're doing projects in in um, Amps, uh, not Amsterdam in. Um, yeah, in Amsterdam, in uh, Antwerp, and also uh, Munich. So we're, we're, there's a lot of, and Los Angeles recently, Chicago, Memphis. Oh, I didn't realize it was expanding beyond, uh, oh, the US, that's fantastic. I mean, congratulations on the project. It's, uh, I, I was really, really happy to read the book and to get the book. And to right, but, no, but the reason why I'm a chief curatorial advisor is because, you know, I'm, I'm just in it, it's too much work, you know. My, the co-founder of Monument Lab, uh, Paul Farber, he's a, you know he's a lot younger than me, and you know I have a family. He doesn't. I am uh, you know uh, the chair of a department, mm -hmm. you know, at a very alpha uh, you know alpha uh, university, right? Work at, at Ivy League universities are super super alpha. You know if you if you write like if I wrote a book, right? Then uh, the uh, people congratulate you, and then they say, "What's next?" <laughs> Unbelievable. No, it's true. It's like yeah. it, it's you, you, the work never ends. It's just um, and everybody's really into it. And I don't think that's entirely healthy or even good. But it's just um, and I'm I'm. It's not good for me because um, I tend to just take it as a challenge to do more and more work. So yeah. Well, I think I think rethinking monuments is really important. You know, yeah. it's something very much on my mind. Rethinking museums as well. Um, that's for another another lecture, I think. Yeah. Um, but we're, I, I'm we're, thinking, doing, we're doing work for the Cleveland Museum of Art. How can, how can we rethink the museum, for example? Oh, fantastic! Oh, that's well. We can we can have a, a further conversation about that. I'd be very very curious. Um, but thinking about names and thinking about places, uh, I was really struck by Melly Shem hates her job. That was originally commissioned for outdoors uh, for the former Witte de Witt Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam uh, in the Netherlands. And that the museum recently announced it's changing its name to the Kunstinstitut Melli. Yeah. Can you talk about this commission uh, and the public's reaction to the work? Yeah, I mean, it's a really delicious story and it really has very little to do with me, right? It was purely fortuitous because I was the inaugural exhibitor at the then called Witt de Witt uh, Center of Contemporary Art in Rotterdam. At that time, the Witt de Witt, uh, which is basically like a Kunstverein, was located in a, let's just say, slightly down and out neighborhood. Nobody went there at night. It was a bit dark and, you know, and it wasn't uh, really a pleasant area. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, nowadays it's totally uh, hipsterville and be t totally gentrified. 
And mm -hmm. so they named it Ritte Witt because it was located, uh, the address was 50 Ritte Witt Strat. So they named it after the street, right? But Ritte Witt is named after Cornelius Ritte Witt, who's, uh, uh, who, who was a colonial officer for the um, Dutch East India Company, which was very much involved in the Indonesian slave trade. Mm -hmm. right? So a very problematic uh, figure. Mm -hmm. right? so, so during this time of social reckoning, there was a process that, uh, uh, you know, to rename the, the thing. But when I exhibited, they had this old billboard frame because the one end of it was, was abutting an alleyway, which has now become a public concourse. And they kept this old uh, billboard frame. And then they said, well, we're going to keep this billboard frame. We're going to refurbish it and we're going to post a poster of the exhibiting artist with all, with all the information, all the talks, the dates of the exhibition, and so on, and, and with an image of, of, of a work, right? And so they said, we'd like to post um, Meli Sham Hates Your Job, and then we'll lay out the text of your name, the dates of the show, and so on, on, on top of it, right? And for whatever reasons, I, I don't even remember why, but for whatever reasons, I said, can we just have the image of the work without any of that text? They had a discussion and they said, okay, fine. The understanding was, was that the billboard, would, uh, the poster would come down at the end of my exhibition, three months later. But and what that happened, was in 1990, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, in 1990, yeah. Because, uh, and so and what happened was once the work uh, came down, signaling the end of my show, and then a new billboard would go up for in, 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 cons you know, in co concordance with the whoever was following me in, in, in the next exhibition, the museum received a lot of phone calls and, uh, and letters even, this is before internet, uh, letters even about um, demanding that uh, Meli Sham return to her place, right? And so then a few weeks after I returned to Vancouver, I received a phone call and I remember it clears a bell and they said, we have a proposition. We would like to reinstall it. And I said, why? And what about the next exhibition? They said, we're getting a lot of public demand for it to be put back up. Yeah. And uh, I said, why? And they said, well, you know, one person in particular said, every city needs a monument to, to uh, people who hate their jobs. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> and it's been there since. It's been, and, and since then, it's been, you know, dozens of Flickr pages. And there are, it's on every tourist brochure. Right, so you see the official tourist brochure at the city hall, even you know, it'll cite the, the, all the sites you can see, and there's there's an arrow, Melly, right? So it's so I didn't have anything to do with that other than just a fortuitous decision to wipe out the rest of the text, yeah. at, uh, uh, explaining my show. But I, but I love it. I love and and people has really have really taken it in. So I feel very lucky because it's very rare for public art to gain such a kind of embrace publicly. Yeah, no, that's, I was so happy to hear that, that announcement and, and surprised and, you know, very proud as well. So um, we have a few uh, questions. Um, so the first one was actually sent early um, and it's a question by Joel Sector and he writes, Mr. Lum, I would be interested to hear about your experience your experience at Documenta 11, working with Oqui and Wazor, and the turn of the century shift to post-colonial perspectivism. Well, I, you know, I can't, um, Oqui was like a, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, person. Um, I met him at the, I was teaching in, in Paris at, uh, as, a, as a professor at the uh, L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, at the time, and uh, he came into uh, the hallways there, and someone said, "Oh, I, you, you got to meet this guy." You know, it was all in French. You got to meet this guy, uh, Oakley and Razor. It's really interesting, and and so on. He's a really talented poet and stuff. T totally unknown. This is like in the uh, earlier part of the 1990s, and or I guess 94, 95 around there, and um, you know, and he was he didn't have any money. He was like, you know, he's a very, very dapper dress, dresser, but he, he didn't have any money. In fact, I had to buy him a coffee and so on. And, and he gave this talk and how he wanted to do this project and, and, and so on. And, and I thought, wow, I don't know. And, I, and at that time, it coincided with the, because I have these periods of, um, I don't mind saying it, of quite deep despondency. 
Mm. And um, and uh, I write about that. I've written about that. And so, and that was, and, and that kind of extends to uh, real serious doubts about continuing on as an artist or can, or, or, rejecting the art system and all, all sorts. I remember your dinners with uh, Rodney Graham, you sharing that with me about those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, um, um, it was in that context. And so he came in right at the right time. And I thought, I need to know this guy. I need to follow this guy because I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. I'm curious about what, um, what art and culture and politics in Africa as lived experiences. I'd never been there before. And so as soon as, uh, uh, as soon after that, I actually um, reached, uh, I, I wrote to uh, NKA Journal of Contemporary African Art because it was Oakley who told me to connect with them. I said, I was interested in writing about um, the uh, Dakar, uh, Dakar or the Dakar Biennale and so on. And, um, you know, and, uh, and then the, I, I see uh, Joanne Bernie Dansker was here earlier. Maybe she's still here. And she was like the um, museum director of Village Stuck in Munich at the time. And uh, I, I, I approached her uh, and I said, hey, I met this guy, Oakley, he's got this great show and uh, called The Short Century and needs a venue for it. That's the only thing that's hindering. Mm -hmm. uh, to make a long story short, she was totally open. It was very rare. It was like, you know, none, none of this kind of Q and A and testing me and stuff. She just said, let's do it. This sounds like a great show. Wow. Right? And um, so I was lucky in, in that way. And uh, yeah, he changed, he changed my life, right? He changed, uh, um, I, I have so many stories to tell. I don't know how to answer it properly. I have so many per personal stories to tell, but look, we, you know, he was not an easy guy to, to uh, be with, by the way. It's not like, you know, uh, you know, he, but he was, um, he was uh, just brilliant and uh, yeah, I miss him. Hmm. There's actually someone who wrote a question around lived experience, uh, Kai Ma, who wrote, thanks for a wonderful talk. Please elaborate the use of lived experience in your work as subject and as process. Well, lived experience to me, there's a, I'm interested in lived experience as a kind of um, field of disconnect from, you know, the, the uh, experience that are, is planned out, experience that's determined you know, uh, administratively determined, right, and so on. Uh, you can say that, oh, I, I work at, I can say I work at a university, I teach these classes, I do this, and so on, I get a paycheck at the end, and so on. But that's not necessarily the lived experience. The lived experience might be, I might be very unhappy in that job, right? That's, that's the lived experience, right? So lived experience has to do with body, uh, your, your consciousness of your body has to deal with processes of um, embodiment that you develop a kind of uh, co a cognizance of, of how your, your immersion in, in the soup of, 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 of the social shapes, your, shapes your, your knowledge, shapes your knowledge. This is not a knowledge that comes from your head, it comes from your body. It's biological even, and so on. So I think that's really important. Lived experience like in Monument Lab was the lived experience of, of neighborhoods, of people on, on uh, you know, who gained their wisdom by working every day in some crummy job and then going home, uh, you know, um, in a dangerous neighborhood perhaps, mm -hmm. and then um, eating fast food because they're, they don't have time to cook for themselves. That's a lived experience. Mm -hmm. well, maybe one last question and then I'll, I'll thank everybody <laughs> for coming. Uh, Christina Martinez, thanks for a great talk. How do you view appropriation in the context of your practice? Um, if, if you mean by appropriation, um, areas where, which are verboten because, um, you know, someone else has a greater right to, to uh, quote or reference something, I'm not all that sympathetic to it, right? I, I mean, I think, you know, I, when I was doing my furniture pieces initially, I got a lot of flack, not a lot, but I got enough flack uh, at the time in the uh, late 70s from uh, uh, women uh, artists saying you're, 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 you're moving into the territory that are, is really the purview of women, furniture and, and things like this. And, and I wasn't, I really didn't, wasn't interested in, in, in you know, who has the right to appropriate, who doesn't have a, a right to appropriate. Of course, that's not to say that you shouldn't be sensitive to all kinds of questions because 
obviously oppressed peoples, subjugated peoples have been uh, seen um, greater degrees of appropriation than, than privileged people. Mm -hmm. Privileged privileged people feel that they can appropriate everything, including just steal things outright from you know, as 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 booty from wars, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously those types of things, I you know, each person has to kind of uh, draw a line that's ethical to to them, right? But I think there's a lot of other areas which is in the in the common terrain of visuality that that um, you know I don't necessarily accede to. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as, a pro, as not having the right on my part to appropriate. Well, I want to thank you very much, Ken. Uh, it's been it's been really a pleasure. And sorry uh, for running over. I didn't realize I ran over. So uh, it's okay. <laughs> I tried to keep our conversation, yeah. you know, <laughs> a bit short. But uh, no, it was really really fantastic. And I want to thank everybody for joining us as well. Um, and to invite people to join us again on November 21st uh, from 1 to 2 to hear the 2020 New Generation Photography Award winning artists uh, talk to Andrew Cunard, Associate Curator of F Photographs at the National Gallery. And I also just want to say how the National Gallery is really happy to collaborate with the University of Ottawa, Department of Visual Arts. Also, um, you know, where I went to school and why, where I studied visual arts uh, in my day. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone again next year, hopefully in person, for the seventh uh, Stonecroft Lecture. So thank you again, Ken. The tragedy is that like, I, I, I feel like having a drink right now with some people. It's, it's, it's totally. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right.